Well, thank you everybody for being so punctual. We start the second session now, responding to the United Kingdom Strategic Defence and Security Review, Ballistic Missile Defence Policy and Capability Options. Um, I've been following the United Kingdom's uh, engagement in missile defence right from the Strategic Defence Initiative in the 1980s when I was in the Ministry of Defence uh, through my time at RUSI when we started the series of conferences in the late, in the late 1990s. Um, the theme very much of the United Kingdom being a good friend on the inside and wanting to be an informed customer should the need arise at some stage in the future, but let's not spend too much money now. Um, uh, uh, but uh, things have moved on a lot with the uh, SDSR, uh, and I'm delighted. Uh, it's been very difficult ever to get Ministry of Defence speakers. I'm delighted that uh, Peter Watkins has agreed to come and uh, give a talk for us today as our first speaker. As I mentioned earlier, he will have to leave at some stage and he won't be taking uh, questions. Um, and if I can just remind you, the presentations are on the record, discussion is without attribution. And uh, that's enough of me. Um, Peter, you've got the biographies, uh, uh, so I won't go through those in detail. So, Michael. The microphone on? Yes. Michael, thank you for the uh, introduction. And um, first of all, I should say it's a pleasure to be here uh, at the 17th Rusi Missile Defence Conference to speak on the British government's policy on ballistic missile defence following, as he said, the publication of the National Security Strategy and the Strategic Defence and Security Review, the SDSR, uh, in November 2015. Um, as you've been just been told, I'm, I'm sorry that I cannot take questions. Uh, this isn't some sort of new sort of adoption of neo-Soviet practices by the British government, but it's a long-standing um, limitation uh, on official speakers in the run-up to domestic elections. So I intend to use my remarks today to put on the record uh, the UK government's policy on uh, ballistic missile defence and why defending against the potential threat of ballistic, ballistic missile attack is of increasing importance to the UK's national security. And I'm conscious that some of what I say may repeat what has already been said uh, in the previous session, but I thought it would be helpful to set out a sort of coherent um, position uh, in terms of the government's policy. So first of all, um, some remarks on the general threat picture. Um, as the Prime Minister wrote in the foreword to the 2015 SDSR, and quote, the world is a darker, more dangerous, more unpredictable place than five years ago, unquote. The threats to the UK and our interests are growing. Indeed, the SDSR describes the threats faced by the UK, including our overseas territories and our interests, that they've increased in scale, complexity and diversity. Now, we do not seek to predict the future, but we do continually seek to develop both the versatility and flexibility of our armed forces and of the decision-making machinery of government to adapt to, the, adapt to the range and scale of crises and threats that we face. And the 2015 SDSR very much helps us to do that and increases our ability to address a greater breadth and scale of security threats and delivers a flexible range of capabilities to do so. So turning to ballistic missiles, they are not, of course, a new threat. They have been employed since the Second World War, but they are now proliferating in number and, in, and improving in reach and accuracy, with both state and non-state actors acquiring ballistic missile technology. There are over 20 non-NATO states which have ballistic missiles, and in the last few years we have seen more frequent use and testing of ballistic missiles by nations such as Iran, Syria, and, in the news at the moment, North Korea. The potential for countries to upgrade their forces to include accurate short-range systems could lead to an increased threat to NATO and NATO-deployed forces. Although not a direct threat to NATO in Europe, the growing capability from North Korea is an increasing cause for concern. The willingness of North Korea to export complete ballistic missile systems, missile technologies, and even complete manufacturing capabilities 
offers the spectre of increased ballistic missile proliferation closer to home. And it's also been widely reported that, th that many of these systems have now been transferred to non-state actors. For instance, reports of Houthi launches of Scud missiles in Yemen. So this worrying new trend in proliferation raises concerns over the control of such capabilities and their threshold for use. So we and our allies must take steps to identify and mitigate the threat of ballistic missile attack, and I'd like to outline what we are doing to defend ourselves. So a few remarks on the purpose of NATO uh, ballistic missile defense. <clears throat> NATO is the bedrock of Euro-Atlantic security and has been for 60 years. At 20 <clears throat> in 2010, at the NATO summit in Lisbon, the UK, along with our NATO allies, agreed to develop a missile defense capability to protect all NATO European populations, territories, and forces. This system was conceived to protect NATO Europe from a limited ballistic missile attack emanating from outside the Euro-Atlantic arena. And as you will have heard in the earlier sessions, the aims of NATO's ballistic missile defense system remain the same today. It is designed to be complementary to, but not a substitute for, nuclear deterrence as part of the full range of NATO capabilities, including conventional forces, missile defense, and nuclear deterrence. And it is purely defensive. The UK government fully supports the aims and ambitions of NATO's ballistic missile defense system. Now there are, of course, critics of this position. There are some who say that the nuclear deal with Iran the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action now negates the need for NATO to have a BMD system. I disagree. These are separate issues. The nuclear deal with Iran, in which the UK played a major role, undoubtedly makes the Middle East and the wider world a safer place. Iran has agreed that it will never seek, develop, or acquire any nuclear explosive device, and agreed to a far-reaching set of measures to ensure that it will not be able to do so. But the nuclear deal will run over several years and should not be conflated with other issues. UN Security Council Resolution 2231 of last July, which endorsed the deal, also expressed serious concern about Iran's ballistic missile program. It called on Iran to cease all launches of ballistic missiles designed to be capable of carrying nuclear warheads. But Iran continues to test its ballistic missile arsenal running counter to the spirit of this Security Council resolution. And, it, and this remains a, a matter of serious concern to the UK and its NATO allies, underlining our assessment about the prolifer proliferation of ballistic missile capability. And then there are some who say that BMD undermines nuclear deterrence, that it is damaging to strategic stability. And I disagree here too. The threats that each capability is designed to deter are different. As the Defence Secretary said in his speech on the UK's independent nuclear deterrent on the 23rd of March at Policy Exchange, our nuclear weapons are, quote, intended to deter the most extreme dangers our nation might face, unquote. Our independent nuclear deterrent, assigned to NATO since 1962, deters a very different potential threat than does ballistic missile defence. Ballistic missile defence aims to change the dynamic of escalation by denying a rogue state any benefit in launching a limited scale ballistic missile attack. And then Russia, which I understand has been discussed a lot so far today. Russia has a long standing concern with NATO's BMD system, which it claims is damaging to strategic stability and undermines its strategic nuclear deterrent. Again, we believe that this is not the case. And as the NATO Secretary General said at the Munich Security Conference on the 13th of February, and perhaps he's been quoted already, our NATO policy on ballistic missile defense has also been clear all along. It is purely defensive, designed to defend our territory, our people, and our forces against threats from outside the Euro-Atlantic area. NATO's missile defense is neither designed nor directed against Russia. It does not and cannot undermine Russian strategic deterrence. Moreover, we have offered Russia cooperation on missile defense. We remain transparent as we continue to develop our program, unquote. So NATO has been open about the system's capabilities with Russia in order to promote trust and reduce the risk of misunderstanding. 
For years, as many of you will know, the Alliance sought cooperation with Russia against the common threat of missiles from countries outside Europe. That included NATO's proposal to create two NATO-Russia joint missile defense centers. We believe that Russian officials understand very well NATO's plans and the capabilities of the SM-3 interceptors which form their backbone, based upon past briefings that NATO has given them. Regrettably, Russia walked away from discussions with NATO on BMD in November 2013, and Russia's subsequent illegal annexation of Crimea and activities elsewhere in Ukraine have made it impossible to continue with business as usual. So it's not NATO's actions which have prevented dialogue with Russia about BMD. And it's hard to avoid the conclusion that Moscow's stance has more to do with posturing than with facts. So we've seen heightened tensions, coupled with irresponsible and unacceptable Russian threats to target allies because of their support for NATO's ballistic missile defense system. Any engagement with Russia on BMD needs to be focused clearly on reducing risk and avoiding miscalculation. To do this, we need, as an alliance, to continue to try to reassure the Russians that BMD is not a threat to Russia and to, reiter to reiterate that we are developing BMD in an open and transparent manner. So I've explained why the UK supports the development of NATO's BMD capability. Now I'll say what the UK is contributing to the NATO program and how this will evolve as the government implements the 2015 SDSR. Of course, the first and greatest responsibility of any government is the protection and defense of its people against any form of threat or attack. And this is encapsulated in the first national security objective in the national security strategy. And that document also, as many of you will know, included two further national security objectives to project our global influence and to promote our prosperity. To achieve those three objectives, the way that we make policy, plan and train must stem from the reality of how we operate. Our SDSR was therefore a culmination of efforts from across government and in-depth consultation with our allies. And again, as the Prime Minister wrote in his foreword, quote, Britain's safety and security depends not just on our own efforts, but on working hand in glove with our allies to deal with the common threats that face us all, reflecting the fact that we cannot achieve our security and prosperity goals in isolation. So multinational solutions are needed to solve global problems. And our approach to ballistic missile defense very much reflects that mindset. Defending against and countering the threat of ballistic missile attack on the UK, its deployed forces and its interests, including our allies, is not just a Ministry of Defense effort, it is not just a whole of government effort, it's a whole of alliance effort. And an effort that needs constantly to adapt to the changing threats that we may face so that we can protect ourselves and our allies in whatever environment we choose to operate. No BMD system can provide, or will in fact ever provide, total assured coverage or act as an impenetrable shield. So there must be a full spectrum of levers that we can draw upon to increase our freedom of maneuver and action. So we see five key tenets to successful and coordinated ballistic missile defense. Number one, counterproliferation. The rules-based international system and norms to counter the proliferation of illicit arms and weapons that might be used against us play a vital role in protecting our security. Number two, deterrence. This is at the heart of the UK's national security policy. Convincing an adversary beyond any doubt that the consequences of any attack, including the use of ballistic missiles, against the UK or its interests, including our allies, will far outweigh any benefits that they seek to achieve. As the SDSR states, defense and protection start with deterrence. And then number three, active defense, or deterrence by denial, a demonstrable capability ready to intercept a limited number of ballistic missiles seeks to dissuade the adversary from this course of action. Their options would reduce to either one of hope that the missiles will somehow get through or seeking to surge or overwhelm the BMD system which could escalate the crisis far beyond their intentions. Number four, 
passive defense, the ability to warn, protect, and if necessary, evacuate those in danger from ballistic missile attack. And then number five, counterforce and disablement. Through credible and undeniable intelligence of an imminent attack, exercising our inherent right to self-defense under international law to deal with the threat. And we believe that effective ballistic missile defense draws on all of these tenets at different stages of a potential crisis. So a little bit on the UK contribution and the SDSR announcement. I don't need to tell this audience that successfully tracking and intercepting different missile types with different ranges and trajectories is an extremely complex and expensive business. It takes multiple sensors and interceptors, which all have to be connected by a common command and control system. This complexity lends itself to close allies working together. And it's important to emphasize that this is all a long-term endeavor. The United States is making a very significant and hugely welcome contribution of radar and ground and sea-based interceptors through its European phased adaptive approach. NATO is developing an alliance command and control system, which is also being developed in stages. And other allies are at different stages of considering or developing national contributions based on their own national circumstances and priorities. So BMD is a capability which, to borrow another phrase from the SDSR, is truly, quote, international by design. So in our SDSR, we looked at all the potential options for UK contributions. Obviously, our starting point, point was what we are already doing, and we spend over £25 million per year supporting our BMD commitments. So first, we make a significant financial contribution to NATO's BMD system. Secondly, and for many years, we've operated the sites at Filingdales and Menwith Hill, where approximately 300 UK personnel are employed, enabling the early warning of ballistic missile threats to the UK and the US, and missile tracking data to inform US BMD engagement decisions to defend the continental US from ballistic missile attack. And thirdly, we operate the UK's Missile Defence Centre, a joint government and industry team to develop and exploit relevant technologies and capabilities to support BMD. So we considered where to put our efforts across all five of the tenets of BMD that I mentioned earlier. As noted in the SDSR, we will continue to devote substantial efforts to tackling proliferation, including ballistic missiles and ballistic missile technology. Our overall aim in our counter-proliferation work is to prevent the spread of further development of weapons of mass destruction capability or advanced military technology that could threaten our interests or regional stability. And there are three strands to this strategy. First, influencing intent by encouraging all states to adhere to norms on the possession and use of particular weapons and making clear the consequences of breaching those norms. Secondly, by controlling access making it as hard as we possibly can for state or non-state actors to acquire technology, for instance, by supporting the missile technology control regime, and thirdly, by disrupting the illicit networks that attempt to circumvent those controls of the international rules-based system. On all of this, we work closely with our allies and relevant international organizations, deploying our diplomatic, intelligence, law enforcement, and scientific expertise. But on capability, we analyzed, how best we, could best, we analyzed how we could best contribute to NATO's developing BMD system. And as this audience will know, the decision we took was to develop a ground-based radar to enhance the effectiveness of the NATO system and to continue the work we have begun on investigating the potential of the Type 45 destroyer. So taking those two in turn, our radar decision was based on three main factors. First, the long-term nature of the threat and the NATO program. We do not believe the threat at this point requires interceptors based in the UK, but we are concerned about the threat to our allies from the areas I've mentioned, and over time to the UK itself. So we decided that the UK should make a national contribution that could enhance the collective architecture. Secondly, the imperative of robust sensing and tracking capability 
especially against an evolving threat. The better the sensor network, the more effective the interceptors can be. Now, our technical analysis and our discussions with our allies suggested ways in which we could enhance the sensor architecture to improve its robustness. And thirdly, we have a world-leading technological expertise in the field of radar technology, which again, I'm sure I don't need to explain to this audience. So the conclusion we reached was that the best and most useful contribution that the UK could make is the provision of ground-based BMD radar. Work is underway to develop this capability, which we expect to be in service by the mid-2020s. Decisions on the radar's location are yet to be made and will be based upon the most effective way to enhance NATO's BMD system, including considering how it will integrate into the existing and planned NATO architecture, and of course on the threat that we will need to counter. And once it's in place, we are confident it will be a significant enhancement to the effectiveness of the NATO architecture. So with the US site in Romania nearing completion, we can expect NATO allies to mark its significance at the NATO at July's Warsaw Summit. I gather you've discussed that already. And I would take, like to take this opportunity to congratulate all involved in the development of the Devasulu site. But the journey will continue beyond that. As a long-term endeavor, all allies will need to continue to build their understanding of how to incorporate BMD into our collective defense mission, alongside conventional forces and nuclear deterrents. And it is a collective responsibility and a measured capability based upon the threat picture we see evolving and being flexible to adapt accordingly. And secondly, I'd just talk, like to speak briefly about the Type 45 destroyer. We've recently conducted two technical trials with the Type 45 to examine its ability to perform different roles in maritime coalitions. The most recent was the at sea demonstration off the northwest of Scotland in October, involving ships from eight nations dealing with both ballistic and cruise missile threats. In that demonstration, a Royal Navy Type 45 successfully proved its ability to detect and track ballistic missiles whilst concurrently performing its air defence role. The UK involvement in this demonstration represents a key component of the UK's prudent research in BMD in order to inform options in the future. Those development options span local self-defence of deployed maritime forces to the ability to contribute to theatre-wide BMD. The Royal Navy is developing a programme to enhance the capability of the Type 45 in the short term with a view to then further evolving maritime integrated air and missile defence as a core capability. So a few concluding remarks. We live, as we all know, in a rapidly changing world, a world with long-term shifts in the balance of global economic and military power, increasing competition between states, and the emergence of more powerful non-state actors. In parallel, the rules-based international system upon which our security and prosperity depend, is being tested. So we must prepare today for the continuing uncertainty that we will face tomorrow. That is why the UK government continues to support the intentions of NATO's ballistic missile defense system, and we will continue to commit significant funds to NATO's BMD network. To protect NATO European territories from the threat of limited ballistic missile attack, emanating from outside the Euro-Atlantic area, primarily the Middle East. I'm sorry if I've had to keep um, underlining that. And we support NATO continuing to be transparent about the capability as it evolves. And perhaps I could underline that point as well. Um, in short, BMD is a core element of NATO and the UK's broad approach encompassing the full spectrum of capabilities to modern deterrence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. That gives us a very good authoritative ground base for our subsequent discussions. And uh, now turn to our next speaker. I have to, um, to uh, confess that uh, Jerry, Peter and I have some common provenance, but that shouldn't affect the richness of the subsequent debate. But Jerry's been uh, Associate Fellow um, at RUSI and um, my advisor and one of our contributors on missile defense from our very early days. And, um,
uh, and so Jay, I'll to you. Thank you, Mike. Um, I come at this subject from an unusual perspective, namely that of a BMD historian. Um, I suspect most of you think that there's no such thing as a history of BMD, um, therefore there can't be such a thing as a historian. But actually, um, BMD has been a, a hardy perennial of international politics um, since at least the 1950s. Um, so what I want to start by doing is, is put this issue from a UK perspective into some sort of policy and historical context. Um, the UK has been considering the subject of BMD at both technical and policy levels since the mid-1940s. We actually have a longer track record in this subject than any other country, including the United States. But our policy has, as often as not, been focused on what we think and should do about other people's BMD, as it has been about whether we should have BMD of our own. And the debate has tended to oscillate between the two, just as the debate has tended to oscillate between technical examination and policy consideration. Um, in past decades, we've not been terribly good at getting those two aspects in sync, um, although I think we're now at the point where they are increasingly aligned. But underpinning UK views on BMD um, has always been uh, a concern about the primacy of the nuclear deterrent. And attitudes towards BMD have been seen in that context. Namely, and to use a rather crude um, shorthand, Whatever you do, say, and think about BMD, don't prejudice Trident. In other words, uh, there are opportunity costs to everything, and maintaining a retaliatory nuclear capability always has policy and fiscal primacy. And secondly, whatever you do and say about BMD, don't call into question the strategic rationale for the nuclear deterrent. And therefore, I think what is often um, a mysterious process of policy deliberation on BMD, certainly as viewed from outside the UK, needs to be seen in that context. As a result of that, British policy towards BMD has always been highly equivocal. It was in March 1985 that the then UK Foreign Secretary, Sir Geoffrey Howe, in this very room, said the following. The attractions of moving towards a more defensive strategy for the prevention of war are as apparent as are the risks. Deterrence has worked and it will continue to work. It may be enhanced by active defences or their development may set us on a road that diminishes security. Now, of course, he made those remarks in a very different time and strategic context, and he was, of course, referring to the SDI Star Wars program in the United States, which expressly was about strategic defences aimed at the Soviet Union. But nonetheless, his scepticism has an enduring resonance in UK policy, albeit one that has shifted significantly in the course of the last decade or so. UK concerns have always been focused on the strategic wisdom, the technical feasibility, and the financial implications of investing in BMD. And that's quite a complicated mix to address. But as I say, we do have a very long history. Uh, indeed, the, world, the world's first plan for an active BMD system was devised in Britain in 1944, even before the first V2 landed on West London. Uh, it was established that existing air defence radars could provide between 60 and 70 seconds warning of a V2 attack. That was sufficient to alert a barrage of gunfire across a 40 kilometre wide front through which the incoming missile would have to fly. It was estimated that a typical engagement would involve the discharge of some 320,000 rounds of ammunition, most of it from the then standard 3.7 inch anti-aircraft gun. Uh, technology did not allow accurate lethality studies at that stage, but I suspect the results wouldn't have been 
impressive. The killer problem, however, was that on the basis that approximately 2% of the ammunition could be, expended to re could be expected to return to Earth unexploded, that represented some 90 tonnes of British high explosive landing on British soil compared to the one tonne of German high explosive carried by the V2 itself. You may imagine that Churchill himself told the army who was responsible for ground-based air defence to go away and think again. Um, later schemes were actually quite a lot more sophisticated but were never implemented because ultimately the V2 attacks in 1944-45 were defeated by the same means that Iraqi short-range ballistic missile attacks were defeated in 2003, namely through the advance of ground troops. But thereafter, the UK had, has had active consideration of BMD with a very large um, research and development programme in the 1950s, although by the end of the decade, the UK gave up on both technical and financial grounds. A landmark in UK views on BMD, um, and one that continues to resonate in the background today, was the ABM Treaty. The UK, of course, was not a signatory of the ABM Treaty, but the ABM Treaty did more for us than it did for the Americans or the Soviets, who did sign the treaty. What the ABM Treaty did was ensure that BMD would not become so widely proliferated as to threaten the credibility of a modest nuclear offensive force, such as Britain possessed. But it also meant that it allowed the Russians, the Soviets as they were then known, to maintain a strategic BMD capability that set the benchmark for the technical requirements of a credible UK offensive capability. A Russian strategic BMD system with much modernization, that of course remains operational to this day. So that was the significance of the ABM treaty. And that has tended to set both the strategic and the technical benchmark of what the UK requires by way of a nuclear deterrent and hence our continuing commitment to Trident. This equivocation about the feasibility and wisdom of BMD for the UK led successive British governments to conclude in policy statements as late as 2002 that it remained, and I quote, premature to invest in the acquisition of active defence capabilities whilst the UK continued to study it. That, of course, has changed recently. That, it seems to me, has changed because of two things. First of all, as Peter Watkins outlined, an increasing awareness of the scale and complexity of missile proliferation, but it has also been as a result of really quite positive uh, and consistent US strategic leadership on the subject, that however much many European governments for many years wished the whole subject of BMD would simply go away, American commitment under all administrations to strategic and tactical BMD has meant that governments could simply not uh, go on ignoring the subject. And that has kept it on the political agenda, which has led to where we are now. In 2010, the UK's SDSR then, in a, fun, in a strategic context that said our overriding strategic aim is to save money because of the financial crisis, said this. We will maintain our existing policy of close cooperation with the US and our other NATO allies on ballistic missile defences. And we intend to support proposals to expand NATO's role. Um, and you could read into that pretty much anything that you wanted. By 2015, as Peter Watkins um, eloquently outlined, the world had moved on. Um, whilst the overriding strategic imperative remains financial, nonetheless, um, UK defence is seeking to rebuild itself from a perceived low point of 2010 and also the strategic imperative both to engage with what the US and NATO is doing and the increasingly evident uh, extent of missile proliferation. So the more recent Defence Review published in November last year said this. The UK has been under constant threat from ballistic missiles since the Second World War. But states outside the Euro-Atlantic area and non-state actors are now acquiring ballistic missile technology. The threat faced by the UK, 
our overseas territories and our military bases has evolved. We will continue to commit significant funds to the NATO Ballistic Missile Defence Network, as well as supporting research and development initiatives and multinational engagement through the UK's Missile Defence Centre. We will invest in a ground-based BMD radar, which will enhance the coverage and effectiveness of the NATO BMD system. We will also investigate further the potential of the Type 45 destroyers to operate in a BMD role. So that was the bare policy statement that Peter Watkins very helpfully uh, put a little bit more flesh on the bones of. So it comes down still to strategic and financial priorities. And that's within the context of a defence budget limited to 2% of GDP. Now, 2% is quite an encouraging figure compared to most NATO allies. Um, it's also quite encouraging in terms of where a year ago we thought we might be. But nonetheless, that still imposes some really quite uh, significant strategic capability and policy uh, choices uh, for the UK. Uh, and the financial aspect has not been helped in, the in recent years by some uh, not always terribly well-informed but grossly inflated cost estimates of what it would take for the UK to acquire BMD. Uh, I've been quoted uh, one defence minister uh, in the previous coalition government asking what it would cost for the UK to do BMD and was told £40 billion sterling which was more than we were currently planning to spend on renewing the Trident system, at which point, unsurprisingly, the minister lost all interest in the subject. That, of course, estimate was what would it take the UK to develop its own bespoke national strategic road that diminishes security. Now, of course, he made those remarks in a very different time and strategic context, and he was, of course, referring to the SDI Star Wars program in the United States, which expressly was about strategic defences aimed at the Soviet Union. But nonetheless, his scepticism has an enduring resonance in UK policy, albeit one that has shifted significantly in the course of the last decade or so. UK concerns have always been focused on the strategic wisdom, the technical feasibility and the financial implications of investing in BMD. And that's quite a complicated mix to address. But as I say, we do have a very long history. Uh, indeed, the, world, the world's first plan for an active BMD system was devised in Britain in 1944, even before the first V2 landed on West London. Uh, it was established that existing air defence radars could provide between 60 and 70 seconds warning of a V2 attack. That was sufficient to alert a barrage of gunfire across a 40 kilometre wide front through which the incoming missile would have to fly. It was estimated that a typical engagement would involve the discharge of some 320,000 rounds of ammunition, most of it from the then standard 3.7 inch anti-aircraft gun. Uh, technology did not allow accurate lethality studies at that stage, but I suspect the results wouldn't have been impressive. The killer problem, however, was that on the basis that approximately 2% of the ammunition could be, expended to could be expected to return to Earth unexploded, that represented some 90 tonnes of British high explosive landing on British soil compared to the one tonne of German high explosive carried by the V2 itself. You may imagine that Churchill himself told the army who was responsible for ground-based air defence to go away and think again. Um, later schemes were actually quite a lot more sophisticated but were never implemented because ultimately the V2 attacks in 1944-45 were defeated by the same means that Iraqi short-range ballistic missile attacks were defeated in 2003, namely through the advance of ground troops. But thereafter, the UK had, has had active consideration of BMD with a very large um, research and development programme in the 1950s, although by the end of the decade, the UK gave up on both technical and financial grounds. A landmark in UK views on BMD, um, and one that continues to resonate in the background today, was the ABM Treaty, 
The UK, of course, was not a signatory of the ABM Treaty, but the ABM Treaty did more for us than it did for the Americans or the Soviets who did sign the treaty. What the ABM Treaty did was ensure that BMD would not become so widely proliferated as to threaten the credibility of a modest nuclear offensive force, such as Britain possessed. But it also meant that it allowed the Russians, the Soviets, as they were then known, to maintain a strategic BMD capability that set the benchmark for the technical requirements of a credible UK offensive capability. A Russian strategic BMD system with much modernization. That, of course, remains operational to this day. So that was the significance of the ABM Treaty. And that has tended to set both the strategic and the technical benchmark of what the UK requires by way of a nuclear deterrent, and hence our continuing commitment to Trident. This equivocation about the feasibility and wisdom of BMD for the UK led successive British governments to conclude in policy statements as late as 2002 that it remained, and I quote, premature to invest in the acquisition of active defence capabilities whilst the UK continued to study it. That, of course, has changed recently. That, it seems to me, has changed because of two things. First of all, as Peter Watkins outlined, an increasing awareness of the scale and complexity of missile proliferation, but it has also been as a result of really quite positive uh, and consistent US strategic leadership on the subject, that however much many European governments for many years wished the whole subject of BMD would simply go away, American commitment under all administrations to strategic and tactical BMD has meant that governments could simply not uh, go on ignoring the subject. And that has kept it on the political agenda, which has led to where we are now. In 2010, the UK's SDSR then, in a, in a strategic context that said our overriding strategic aim is to save money because of the financial crisis, said this, we will maintain our existing policy of close cooperation with the US and our other NATO allies on ballistic missile defences. And we intend to support proposals to expand NATO's role. Um, and you could read into that pretty much anything that you wanted. By 2015, as Peter Watkins um, eloquently outlined, the world had moved on. Um, whilst the overriding strategic imperative remains financial, nonetheless, um, UK defence is seeking to rebuild itself from a perceived low point of 2010 and also the strategic imperative both to engage with what the US and NATO is doing and the increasingly evident uh, extent of missile proliferation. So the more recent Defence Review published in November last year said this. The UK has been under constant threat from ballistic missiles since the Second World War. But states outside the Euro-Atlantic area and non-state actors are now acquiring ballistic missile technology. The threat faced by the UK, our overseas territories and our military bases has evolved. We will continue to commit significant funds to the NATO ballistic missile defence network, as well as supporting research and development initiatives and multinational engagement through the UK's Missile Defence Centre. We will invest in a ground-based BMD radar, which will enhance the coverage and effectiveness of the NATO BMD system. We will also investigate further the potential of the Type 45 destroyers to operate in a BMD role. So that was the bare policy statement that Peter Watkins very helpfully uh, put a little bit more flesh on the bones of. So it comes down still to strategic and financial priorities. And that's within the context of a defence budget limited to 2% of GDP. Now, 2% is quite an encouraging figure compared to most NATO allies. Um, it's also quite encouraging in terms of where a year ago we thought we might be. But nonetheless, that still imposes some really quite uh, significant strategic capability and policy uh, choices uh, for the UK. 
uh, and the financial aspect has not been helped in, the la in recent years by some uh, not always terribly well informed but grossly inflated cost estimates of what it would take for the UK to acquire BMD. Uh, I've been quoted uh, one defence minister uh, in the previous coalition government asking what it would cost for the UK to do BMD and was told 40 billion sterling which was more than we were currently planning to spend on renewing the Trident system, at which point, unsurprisingly, the minister lost all interest in the subject. That, of course, estimate was what would it take the UK to develop its own bespoke national strategic BMD capability from scratch without drawing on what others are doing. It neatly, neatly illustrates that if you want a sensible answer, you have to ask the right question in the first place. But as Peter Watkins quite clearly outlined, you can't look at BMD in isolation, although the UK has something of a track record of trying to do that. It has to be part of a comprehensive policy for deterrence, defence and non-proliferation. And that's in the context where, as many in the MOD would acknowledge, even our thinking about deterrence has atrophied somewhat since the end of the Cold War, as the focus of our military effort has become stabilisation operations in hot, dusty places that aren't doing terribly well. That clearly is now shifting, and there's a growing awareness that we have to now start seriously thinking about the potential for confrontation, if not actually conflict, with significant state actors. Thanks to the UK Missile Defence Centre, it's my outside perception, and I stress it is an outside perception, that our level of technical understanding is rather more advanced than necessarily all of our strategic understanding. Though, as I said in my uh, opening remarks, my belief is that we are now getting much, much better at bringing the two into alignment. And as Peter Watkins outlined, we already do quite a bit. The Filingdale's early warning system, the satellite ground station at Menwith Hill, the technical missile defence centre, and our contributions to NATO. Although I'm sure the... Uh, Americans in the audience will have listened askance at the financial scale of our BMD commitment, 25 million, that's about 40 million US, to BMD and all the bits that we purport to do. So what are the issues today? Do we go the NATO route or should we be looking at some bespoke independent national capabilities? Should our priority be tactical or should it be strategic? Turning first to the tactical issue, the Type 45 is clearly uh, uh, a basis on which to work. Uh, and in view of the growing uh, anti-ship ballistic missile threat from Iran, China and potentially others, the issue is really not should the Type 45 be adapted to a tactical BMD role, but actually why on earth would you not? It is, after all, only another variation of the maritime air threat. Should the UK invest in land-based tactical BMD? You could make a case to say that we ought. Uh, it's of note that we are the only significant military power in the world that doesn't have a medium-range land-based surface-to-air missile. But if we were prepared to engage in significant state-on-state -state conflict against Iraq with a known extensive BM capability, not just once but twice without having a tactical BMD capability, I'd suggest that that's unlikely to be a priority in the future. Should the Type 45 be adapted for strategic BMD? Um, there have been suggestions, I know, that we should adapt SM3 and put it into the Type 45. Uh, personally, I'm a skeptic on that subject. Uh, the cost and the time to integrate SM3 into a completely different command system means that by the time we spent a very large sum of money and spent very many years of doing it, the Type 45 would be approaching its out-of-service date. So I think the window of opportunity may be fast closing there. I don't detect um, in anything that I hear in government see in the open press, or we earlier heard from Peter Watkins, that suggests that the UK is on the verge of investing in a strategic interceptor capability. Were we to do so in the future, SM3 would be the route to go, but I think a bespoke off-the-shelf Aegis uh, 
uh, SM3 package put into some sort of simple, austere, uh, single-purpose platform would be the cost-effective way to go. After all, there is a parallel with our defensive strategic capabilities. We don't put a couple of Trident tubes into an SSN. We have a dedicated SSBN that, is, that only does offensive strategic capability. The US have gone a different route with Aegis, but that's because of a very long, 30-decade-long evolution of Aegis. If you were starting from scratch, it seems to me that there are both fiscal and strategic reasons for going for a bespoke defensive strategic capability. And the, and the, 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 um, the benefits of an off-the-shelf purchase are financially clearly attractive. But strategically, the UK benefits from the fact that we're in the northwest of Europe and most of the non-Russian ballistic threats come from the southeast. So it makes the defence of the UK territory a less pressing issue for us than it is for most of the rest of NATO. That is a luxury we currently enjoy. So it seems to me that our strategic imperative will be to make an appropriate burden-sharing response in the interests, A, of influencing uh, what NATO does in the BMD area, but also as part of the wider principle of alliance burden sharing, which is not just about recognising the Americans can't do it all themselves, we all have to play a role, but actually burden sharing performs a strategic imperative of its own in terms of being the essential glue behind the alliance. And I think that's going to be increasingly true in the BMD area. So where do we stand uh, in relation to strategic threats from other states. We seem to be edging towards, although it's not been explicitly outlined, although Peter Watkins, I think, came fairly close to it to say, that in relation to large-scale nuclear peer competitors, Russia and China, we will continue to rely on nuclear retaliation, hence the primacy accord to Trident. In relation to other longer-range strategic nuclear threats, North Korea, Iran, in the future, who knows what else. Um, we would prefer not to have to rely on nuclear retaliation, and strategic BMD gives us the option to go another arguably more credible route. And so it seems to me that is pretty much where we are. There remains a degree of equivocation in UK policy, but it has moved on very substantially uh, in fact, out of all recognition, since Mike and I attended the first Rusi Missile Defence Conference in, I think, 1998. Um, and we're not at the end of that journey yet. Um, I think the uh, acquisition, not just the acquisition, but the UK development of a ground-based radar is a particularly interesting development. Uh, it sort of came out of the blue in the SDSR, although there was clearly some thinking underlying it. And I think that's going to be the most interesting. If I were a betting man, I'd say it will look like a variation of Samson and it will end up in Cyprus. But that is purely a bit of uh, semi-informed speculation on my part. You first heard it here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jerry. It bears mention, I think, uh, when you mentioned the comprehensive policy in deterrence and defence, that uh, in our, some of our previous recent conferences in our far side chats, um, the British government view has been sort of, yes, absolutely, uh, our contribution to NATO in the comprehensive policy is the huge amount that we spend on the deterrent part of this, so others can do the rest. Um, anyhow, <laughs> now, uh, Peter Roberts, uh, 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 our senior research fellow in sea power and maritime studies. I should mention that uh, Peter wrote uh, an occasional paper for UC, UK Ballistic Missile Defence Drivers and Options, um, in August last year uh, to inform the Strategic Defence and Security Review. Peter. Thanks, Mike. Um, uh, it's very tough following uh, two great speakers. Uh, one coming at it through the policy lens, another a sort of historical, practical view, uh, without obviously any inside knowledge at all there, Jerry, but a huge um, you know, background knowledge. So um, uh, I guess I'm going to offer perhaps a conceptual view, uh, a little bit of a practical view, but most importantly, uh, I want to disagree with everything that's been said, because frankly, uh, there would be no room for discussion, debate, or questions if we all just agreed and said it was all going along fantastically. So I intend to take a... Uh, a completely uh, different view and frankly having heard these uh, the, the UK policy um, I just don't understand what it's for um, 
uh, I don't understand how the UK really is talking about these five pillars with any degree of uh, background or, or provenance at all. If you look at the history of what the UK has contributed in the last five, ten years to each of those five tenants, uh, the answer is a lot of words and very little else. Uh, indeed, if one looks within the Ministry of Defence at what is uh, the UK's driver in BMD or uh, missile defence, it is about force protection of deployed forces. And that's it. The rest is really just some talk, some... Uh, grossly optimistic hope uh, that it won't come to pass. Because there's this dichotomy which we heard discussed within UK policy, which is the threat's changing, it's hugely complex, it's a fast, dynamic world that is enormously challenging for decision makers, uh, and yet we're not really going to do much about it, even though it's going to take a huge amount of time to integrate any of these capabilities for the UK. There's this dichotomy that says... Everything's changing, but we're just going to prevaricate a bit because that suits us financially. There's a dichotomy between saying, we're up for it. We, the UK, have a voice. We have a position in the world, and we have an aspiration to do things, and yet we're going to stay as reliant and dependent on, UK, on US capabilities as ever before. US capabilities will underpin our security, and a little bit more about that in a minute. So in the Ministry of Defence, to me, it sounds like this is about force protection. And it's about force protection on the smallest possible scale that makes it affordable. It's not about an aspiration that gives partners and allies any capability or protection. It's about our own self-serving interests of protecting troops. Uh, and I find this a little hard um, because it's about protection really of what? Now, the UK view uh, seems to me that it's about a protection of British jobs. It's not about selection of the greatest capability. It's about uh, selection and protection of partners, particularly with France. And many will have read with interest the announcements that were made in March this year uh, in Paris. And it may be about protection of deployed forces at some stage in due course, if we manage to integrate it in time before the platform we're choosing to integrate it on goes out of service. There really isn't much there. But I suppose for 25 million a year, that's pretty much what you get. What it distinctly isn't about, it, it isn't about critical national infrastructure in the UK. It's not about protecting cities, and it's not about protecting people at all. There is nothing in there. And to me, this is the problem, that the UK conceives ballistic missiles as a military threat still. It still sees them entirely through a military prism. And yet, this is surprising because the UK talks about everything else in an economic and financial prism. It's the only way the UK can comprehend things is through purely a financial prism, and therefore perhaps we need to recast the ballistic missile threat in some of these ways. Because at the moment, the UK homeland is, of course, dependent on the fantastic uh, NATO BMD shields, some of which we've heard already, this great burden sharing uh, that will save us all. And it's not designed against Russia, of course, and, and no one is saying it is, <clears throat> except perhaps the Polish. Uh, and the Romanians and the Estonians and various others who would like the occasional capability uh, to prevent uh, the much threatened uh, nuclear occasional strike on Denmark uh, to be prevented by some kind of capability, but it's not designed against that in any way, shape or form. But the assumptions here are sort of, again, a conspiracy of optimism about timing and sequencing, and there are some serious questions which no one in NATO has answered, indeed no one in NATO can answer. So let's talk a little bit about the rules of delegation for rules of engagement. Does this go through this great political scheme uh, of design? Is the release authority for individual interceptors vested in the commanding officer of a warship? That question is not answered. It doesn't come under the extended defense umbrella doctrinally. Where's the answer to this? Who's even asking the question? Because, frankly, it's a little bit inconvenient. We also need to talk about prioritization. Prioritization and protection of cities. Because, unfortunately, the NATO BMD shield doesn't protect all of Europe or all of NATO. It only has so much capability. If we want to protect our cities, funny old thing, we need to buy that protection. It doesn't come for free, and at the moment, NATO's not funding it. So luckily, we have this great 
passive defense scheme where we'll get sufficient warning of a ballistic missile being launched in the Middle East and we'll have time to leave the center of London uh, and get on a train. Southwest trains um, were exceptional this morning for timekeeping and be able to escape Waterloo and Victoria and, and get down to the south coast because we'll all, be, we'll all be completely safe in those methods. I mean, really, are we talking about this in the modern day? That evacuation is frankly possible in the area we're talking about. It strikes me as strange. But those targets are the key. We sort of talked about this state-based way of looking at it, assessing how states are behaving, and yet when we talked about threat behaviours, everything that came out in, um, in the excellent first presentation, everything that came out in the street defence review, was about how difficult this was becoming because the number of ballistic missiles that are being handed to non-state-based groups really remove this sort of idea of decision-making through state-based structures. Um, and even though state-based structures are not looking at ballistic missiles in a conventional kind of form, we're not looking at adversaries who are planning to attack deployed forces, who are planning to engage in the decisive battle. We're not looking at adversaries who are going to even fight by our rules. They are applying asymmetric advantage by fighting us not in the same domain or with the same rules in moral, legal, and ethical terms. That's their asymmetric advantage. It's not technology. It's not even scale. It's about how they choose to fight us and how we choose to respond. So given these dynamics in adversaries that are seeking an asymmetric advantage, I mean, why would you pick to uh, try and hit you know, one UK armoured division or the US 82nd Airborne with a ballistic missile when you could hit London? Because our enemy is not looking to destroy our forces. They're looking for a cognitive impact. They're looking for economic disruption. They're looking to gain influence over the general population and the international media. This is about messaging. And this is where we fail to understand ballistic missiles, I would say, in their very nature. By placing them purely in a military boundary, in a military silo, and sort of putting them to one side and considering them, we do a disservice to our adversaries and to ourselves. So perhaps now it's time to look at reverse of geography. Instead of looking about how far they can strike, it's look about how far we have to defend. This is range rings from London, 1,000, uh, 3,000, and 5,000 uh, kilometers. Uh, these are the nations where not necessarily rogue states, but rogue actors could hit. Those that have the ability uh, and the interest in taking a shot at London. And London is attractive because it is so well defended there is no other way to hit it that the number of operations that the security services and the police unpick and overturn every year makes it a very difficult target for even symmetrical terrorist activities, if there is such a thing. You know, you only need to look at Brussels to understand that, you know, terrorists and guerrillas are uh, much more fluid than we are, that they will change their, their doctrines, their methods, and their targets. Paris became too difficult to hit, so they hit Brussels. London is a difficult target for a conventional suicide bomber. It's not so difficult for a ballistic missile. So perhaps we have to start to think about things in a slightly different way. And we need to come back to this, who's protected? And maybe we should look at who needs protecting. Because if we revisit this policy, actually the aims and ambitions from a military sphere shouldn't necessarily be those in British jobs, partnerships, and deployed forces. The area, I would argue, that we need to focus on is on critical national infrastructure, on cities, on people. And within that, we may to need to make some very, very careful assessments about are we going to protect individual cities or are we going to protect a nation? Is this just about protecting the city of London or is it about Birmingham as well? or even Edinburgh or, or Glasgow, of course. So against this, we sort of have a, a difference. If we're not regarding it in a military sphere, you know, and we're looking at it through an economic way, how do we, how do we present this to the British people? Is it some kind of you know, bigger national security question? Is it simply a question of how they spend their tax pounds? 
Is it about national security, about economic prosperity? Where does this come from? How do we put it together? So we come back to this scorecard of, of the UK BMD policy. Yes, it takes those military aims and objectives uh, that came out from you know, gap analysis conducted by the Ministry of Defence. We can't protect deployed forces. We'll probably need to do so in about 10 to 15 years, and, and we'll get to that in due course. Uh, but actually, the policy has very little coherence across an alliance. Uh, because a BMD alliance structure might look like nations who we'll hear from tomorrow uh, who are actually investing in interceptor vehicles from themselves. Because in the future, this reliance and dependency on the US, there's no guarantees that that will be there. But it also relies on, you know, the UK policy relies on conventional orthodoxy, a way of conceptualizing people's decision making, adversaries and ourselves, in a very different way, in a sort of very old fashioned way. You know, sort of linear building blocks, rational actors. This is how it's being conceived at the moment. And there's a lack of appreciation for perhaps the more complex, the more irrational, those we cannot understand. And therefore, one might level a degree of conceptual simplicity or a simplistic approach from the UK. A desire to be able to talk about doing anything but not really funding much underneath it. To try and make deterrence some kind of binary function. You either have it or you don't. It contributes to deterrence or it doesn't. It's not binary at all. And it doesn't deal at all with reassurance either. So really, it's not fitting any of these. And neither does it sort of express an ambition. It sort of is designed under almost a foreign policy objective right now. It's not grounded in any reality or truth. And I think that perhaps is what really needs readdressing uh, when we come to a review of BMD policy in due course. Thanks very much.